Till now, it's all been fun and games, cops and robbers, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> but you're in the shit now. Welcome to our part three coverage of Predator 2, where we look at the details and nuances of the film. If you haven't seen our behind the scenes videos, we suggest you do that first. Otherwise, let's continue. Now, right up front, I need to point out there are two screenplays that I did not cover in my first two videos because the third draft dated January 16th, 1990, which was the shooting script, and the final version, which had many revisions, as you can see, were very similar to the second version of the screenplay, dated December 1989. I didn't want to just repeat the same old story points, so I decided to go over significant deviations with the last two versions as we go through the film itself. The novelization written by Simon Hawk has a few deviations as well, but not a huge amount, and there is evidence that the author had access to the shooting scripts, which you will soon see. Simon Hawk's novel is very interesting as it shows points of views from various characters, including the Predator. During Predator scenes, it relates its thoughts as to why it's doing what it's doing, and characters like Tony Pope are more fleshed out. These things are very nice additions to understanding characters deeper in the film if you are into that kind of thing. And to be honest, Predator 2 is a freight train that doesn't make time for its characters, as it's a menacing film from beginning beginning to end, so if you want depth in characters, you need to peel away the layers of the film and be very astute to details as you watch it. The novels, and of course earlier screenplays, help in identifying these things. And that is why we cover this stuff at our channel with every movie. The novel lays out the city hunter's motives up front. After the Predator died from the first film, its ship autopiloted back to the Predator homeworld, and its battle with Dutch was relayed to its kind from a recording unit to its ship. The city hunter was very intrigued by this, and so he heads to Earth to find worthy game to match the Dutch character. The first thing we see after the title is the Predator's heat vision, and this was done by a special camera. After filming was completed, color would be added to the footage to give it a Predator look. The first outdoor scene of the film was shot during three days. If you notice, the film is very yellow, and this was on purpose, because Hopkins wanted the film to have a western look, with shootouts and dulled colors giving it a cigarette smoke feel to it. A thing to notice is that Harrigan sideswipes Hardcore's van. The van would often be abused throughout later scenes as the movie would progress as a joke. Harrigan's gun is a modified Desert Eagle, and this gun was specifically picked for its size to match Glover, as he was a very tall man. Rather than have him carry a tiny police revolver, they upscaled his weapon to match his physique. When Harrigan is driving while hanging out the doorway, he's not driving at all. In the back seat, was Henry Kingy, who was the actual driver of the car. I love El Scorpio, which was also played by stuntman Harry Kingy. Come and get in, El Scorpio is ready. In the first Predator film, Henry was the insurgent who drove himself to a fiery death. We covered that Henry almost died during the stunt where he fell from the building. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then I suggest you check out part two for those details. Back on the rooftop, when Harrigan sees the Predator, a red Predator suit was filmed much like the first film. This Predator suit has no dreadlocks because it was referred to by the team at the time as a matting nightmare. So, whenever you see a camouflaged predator in this film, you will see no dreadlocks. The book actually claims that when Harrigan drew his gun on the Predator, it was about to move in for the kill, but when Danny entered the area with other cops, it refrained from its impulsive nature. Remember, this Predator is young and thirsty for proving itself, and we will go into this later. Now, the blood in this room, where all the bodies are, seems excessive for the movie, but in fact, one of the police consultants for the movie stated that it would be this messy in reality. So this scene is very lifelike and is one of the many reasons 
why the MPAA had problems with this film. In the January shooting script, Pilgrim would commend Harrigan for going in the building that Heinemann dressed him down for, and once again, Harrigan would ask the captain if he was going to celebrate Leona's birthday with him and his team, to which Pilgrim says yes. The name Peter Keyes derives as a direct nod to Mr. Keyes, who is trying to capture the alien in 1982's E.T., In his commentary, Hopkins also referred to close encounters of the third kind. In the novel and comic, Jerry Lambert was well known, and he was nicknamed the Lone Ranger. He had a shady past because he refused backup and killed four bank robbers. His partner died during the event, and the police blamed him for the death while the mayor gave him a commendation. With no love at his current station, Lambert transferred to Harrigan's team. This is why Glover would lecture him in the film and put him in his place at the department later. During filming, Maria didn't want to get too close to Bill Paxton because she worried it would show in the film. This is what Paxton had to say about it. Maria was kind of like, she said, well, I, don't, I, I can't get to know you too well. You know, we're not supposed to like each other in the movie. Despite this, I love when they're together on the screen. Whether it is their chemistry. Hey! Hey! Are you both okay? Fine. How are yours? Or they're just irritating each other. Especially this scene when she's pacing back and forth, rolling her eyes, and then finally loses it to get the man away from her. But he doesn't get the hint. You and my partner both up because there's somebody is screaming bloody murder. Oh, you, you get it. You, you got it. There was a lot of potential for these characters, and there is nuance in their performances, but unfortunately, we aren't allowed to explore them fully because the film is less focused on the characters and more on the action. Now I'm going to go off on a tangent and go over the arc of these two characters right now. After Danny dies, the two become a strong team. We know this because when Leona first met him, she was calling him an asshole. Who is this dude? Yeah, what an asshole. And then later, when he makes a mistake, she steps in and says, we made a mistake, showing how close they are in their work. And then this morning, I lost him. We lost him. In the early scripts and the shooting scripts and the novel, there was a cut scene where Lambert is caring for Leona because she looks sick and he wants her to go home rather than go with him on the metro to find the slaughterhouse. But we didn't get to see any of that. This scene would have shown some of his character growth before his arc was finalized on the subway. At the very end, he puts the life of his partner before himself and stays behind to ensure she is safe. This is a far cry from a lone ranger persona, who is a showboat and a ladies' man. Leona's character and arc was just shredded to pieces, though, and it's a shame. They don't explore her at all with her husband at her party, which was filmed, but cut. In earlier scripts, she talked about her rugged past, which we talked about in earlier videos, and she noted to Lambert that she didn't know if she was ready to have a baby. And yet, it's that very baby that caused the predator to show mercy on her. Yet the final product that we got totally skipped over the narrative points that matter for this character. I can't fathom why anyone would have wanted this out of the film on an intelligent level, but alas, I'm sure Fox executives or producers who were impatient to have action had something to do with it. Now, a very disturbing and distasteful part in the novel is when Ramon Vega's apartment is broken into. The novel states that the Jamaicans take advantage of his lady guest before killing him. Did the filmmakers imply this at all? Well, possibly. If you watch closely to the left of the open door as the Jamaicans close it, you can see one of the Jamaicans restraining the lady. However, in the January script, it does note that one of the Jamaicans pin her on the bed, but then throws her aside to focus on Ramon. As to which scenario occurs, it's up to you. Another really sad and brutal thing about Ramon's girl is that she is just a girl Ramon met at a nightclub and was attracted to his wealth. 
She was won over by his opulence, and a one-night stand occurred. The comic book for the film provided this information, but regardless of whether you acknowledge this material or not, she is most likely now traumatized for life, whatever the case. Now, Adam Garber was a good number two man for Keys, and it would have been great if he could have returned to the Predator series. But if you want to check out the actor, Adam Baldwin, you can see him in a ton of other films like DC Cab, My Bodyguard, Full Metal Jacket, Independence Day, The Patriot, Serenity, and of course, Firefly. And that's just the tip of his film library. Leona's birthday party was cut severely, but you can see the banner stating she is 29 and counting. In the book, and all scripts, her husband, Rick Cantrell, would have been introduced here. Now, I want to take a moment and point out this specific line in the shooting script. This was filmed. I've been feeling like shit the whole week. Now it is possible she's just wearing a ring on her wedding finger, and he is her boyfriend, but this goes against what every script stated to date. So this directly debunks a theory that exists out there, where fans actually claim that Lambert is the father of Leona's child. <laughs> I hope that was an attempt at humor. I'm sure a part of the reason many fans want this to be true is because they want Lambert to be the ancestor to Hudson in Aliens. However, I hate to break it to those who believe in this theory that common sense can debunk this theory easily, since these characters have only known each other for a few days. The baby in her stomach is not a few days old. This is what a baby would look like at the two-week stage. What the predator sees in her womb is a far cry from two weeks. So this theory just needs to die. It's wishful thinking. It's not logically thought out at all. In the book, during the party, Harrigan and his boss would discuss Keys, and Harrigan would state that Keys is a phony and is after something other than drug dealers. Pilgrims would tell him to lay off. To be honest, I was really frustrated that Danny was killed so early in the film because I was a big fan of Ruben around the 90s, and I wanted him to be in the film longer. This is clearly a personal issue for me, but I just wanted to say that I wished he was in the film longer. There would be a funeral scene for Danny that was filmed, and after the scene, Harrigan would be hounded by Pope. Captain Pilgrim would force Pope away from Harrigan, and then, just before Harrigan drives away, he would purposely back into Pope's van. This scene was not used for the film, but can be found on the 2004 DVD special features. This would be the second time Pope's van would be abused by Harrigan, out of his contempt for the reporter. Now, a subplot from the film that was cut involved Heinemann and Harrigan. Both of these men used to be close friends, but when Heinemann was promoted, he became a politician, and the two men parted ways. There was a scene where Heinemann talked to Harrigan and tried to talk him down as a friend, but Harrigan brushes him off. With no choice, Heinemann gives it to him in the subsequent meeting. I actually appreciate this because it's very raw. Harrigan hates Heinemann to the point that he can't rationally communicate with him anymore. And it's honest, warts and all, and I really like that. The subplot between the two characters would continue later in the film, which we will cover. Gary Busey really encouraged Danny Glover to be rough on him during their confrontation scene, so Danny pushed him up against the wall pretty hard in response, giving it a more real vibe. I just love how Gary doesn't back down either, as if he has no problem throwing down with him. Him, and in response, Danny perfectly smacks the air by his face. King Willie was played by Calvin Lockhart, who was a big star in the 70s. In 1970 alone, he was in three films. He had the leading role in the excellent Halls of Anger. He was also in Cotton Comes to Harlem and Myra Breckenridge. Most should recognize him from his most famous film, Coming to America. When King Willie meets his fate, the water effect was a major deal for the time. Firstly, there was a dolly track with a motion control camera that would move in one direction. The second element was copper tubes with several holes that spit water at timed intervals. Then they would film an actor in a suit with timed steps to match the spitting water. It was hard to get the steps to match the spurting water, 
but after several attempts, they would finally get it all to match. Lastly, the sparks shorting around the suit was hand animated. There were scenes where Harrigan walked around the town and was followed by the Predator, but because the camouflaged effects were so difficult in the urban environment, they were cut. There was footage of Harrigan stopping by a taxidermy shop where the Predator would be amazed and interested in the establishment, which was explored in scripts and the novel as well, but according to Jim and John Thomas, the taxidermy shop with the Predator was never filmed. Danny's necklace is a direct challenge from the Predator to Harrigan. It is basically announcing that he is now his target, and clearly Harrigan knows he's in danger or being a target by someone because of the way he reacts. Unlike the first Predator, this creature is making its presence known by taunting Harrigan. It sees him as the prize target, and the creature will now systematically attack those close to him to enrage Harrigan. The novel states that the Predator does this in an effort to goad Harrigan so that he will be a more challenging and satisfying confrontation. I think this is one of the things that makes Predator 2 so good, as the film basically makes the city hunter one of the main characters for the film as well. In the first film, the Predator was in the background, covert and elusive, until it was killed. In this film, the Predator is seen often, watching, moving about on screen, with an unrelenting thirst for blood, and it's a very different creature from the other Predator films. Both Stephen Hopkins and Kevin Peter Hall has stated that this Predator is young, impulsive, and breaking a lot of rules. He's off on a wild trip. This one is not doing what normal Predators do, you know, which is hunt and go by the rules. He's definitely breaking all the rules. And the film shows it loudly. It's a really interesting predator. Truthfully, the brashness of this creature and the attention it is drawing to itself almost gets it captured by keys later. And had it been apprehended, its technology and the creature itself would have fallen into human hands while a normal predator would never allow such a thing to happen. This predator seems to be daring anyone to fight it and doesn't care about witnesses. It reveals itself to Leona without its camouflage on. It's climbing on buildings, running on rooftops, and yelling at the top of its lungs without its camouflage on. It's running away from the subway without its camouflage on. Its actions are just arrogant and sometimes careless. It was a very different approach from the first film, and I really appreciate this creature is so different. Again, this is just another plus for the movie. But now, we have to end it here. I know this was one of our shorter videos, but we have a lot going on production-wise. In our final video, we will cover the rest of the movie, and hopefully, we won't have any protesters. Back off, Psycho! Release that beautiful soul! Yeah, sport hunting is murder, you sick son of a bitch! We're really glad you visited us, and please like and subscribe as it will help. Super thanks are wonderful, but sharing is even better. Thanks.